Dr. Sherry Shelley. She comes to us from NIH, from the All of Us program. She's the Deputy Chief Medical and Scientific Officer. Um, the lead for ancillary studies in the All of Us Research Program at NIH. Um, she's going to tell us a little bit about that program today and um, her work with the workbench. Um, she was previously a program officer in epidemiology and genomics research program at NCI. And her interests include genomics, personalized medicine, and integration of genetic and genomic information in clinical and public health practices. Hopefully you'll see some of the connects that you can make by uh, partnering with us through our data. Um, so the All of Us Research Program's mission is to accelerate health research and medical breakthroughs by enabling an individualized prevention, treatment, and care for all of us. And we do that in three ways. The first is nurturing uh, partnerships for decades with a million or more participants who reflect the broad diversity of the United States. The second is we're delivering one of the largest, richest biomedical data sets that is broadly available and secure to use. And third, just because we have uh, really engaged these participants and delivered this uh, really robust uh, ecosystem, doesn't mean that people will come to it. So we're hoping to catalyze an ecosystem of communities, researchers like you guys, and funders who make all of us an indispensable part of health research. Um, we are really hoping to engage people and communities who have traditionally been left out of medical research in the past. And so um, I'll, I'll be referring to what we call underrepresented in biomedical research. And these are the communities that we're really hoping to engage um, in the All of Us Research Program. We're looking to combine biological factors along with social determinants of health on a large, inclusive scale. We're going to be following participants as they move, age, and grow. So this is a longitudinal study. We're actually getting data over time on these folks. And we really hope to make it uh, easily accessible to any researchers with a uh, secure internet connection. So you no longer have to be at the elite uh, university with the computing system. Uh, we're really trying to make this really accessible for everyone. We have two types of enrollment to get into the program. Um, I just want to go through that a little bit so that you can sort of understand uh, the program overall. And so participants can come in through our health provider organizations or they can be a direct volunteer and go to joinallofus.org to be a part of the program. I'm actually a participant myself, and it's really nice to sort of see um, from the participant standpoint and then so, sort of from the researcher standpoint um, what, you know, what the differences are and where I can give feedback. So um, encourage you and, and your uh, patients to, petition, to uh, join the program. We have a uh, protocol that includes uh, uh, linkage to electronic health records, as well as surveys that participants actually answer. Um, they provide a physical measurements at an in-person visit when we first enroll the participants, as well as biospecimens. Um, I'll go through the, the depth of this in just a minute. We also are um, sharing data from wearables, such as Fitbit and Apple Health Kit. Uh, this is going to continue to grow over time, and the amount of data that we're getting in as well as the number of participants is going to grow over time. So this is not a static database. It's growing in real time. Um, so a little bit about EHR. So right now, participants need to be 18 years or older. However, we are launching pediatrics uh, this year, and we hope to enroll our first pediatric uh, participants by the end of this year. So we're very excited about that. We have a really dynamic online video consent that people go through. And that consent really um, goes through a number of uh, what to expect from the program and things like that. But it also uh, includes authorization for sharing their electronic health data with researchers. So right now, within our EHR um, data, we currently have demographics, visits, diagnoses, procedures, medications, lab visits, and vital signs. Um, but we're really working to try to um, ex expand what we have in the electronic health record. So we actually get the really um, concrete stuff like clinical notes and uh, radiology reports, mental health reports, substance abuse and alcohol, and even more laboratory results that have um, the lab values that you can actually pull out um, of our data. 
I mentioned that our participants actually uh, provide survey uh, answers through surveys, and so um, we have a series of different surveys that are available to our participants. Certainly, they do not have to do all of them. They can sort of pick and choose what they want to do, and so um, not everyone has answered every single survey. But we have a basic survey that goes over basic demographic information. We um, have an overall health survey, a lifestyle survey, which includes like alcohol use, tobacco, things like that. Healthcare access and utilization that really tells us are people having trouble actually getting care? What does that look like? Uh, personal and family health history, as well as social determinants of health. We have a number of uh, surveys where the data is still available, but they're, they're actually closed to participants. Many of these were around the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, one that was released a few different times is called the uh, COVID-19 Participant Survey Experience, or our COPE survey. Uh, not only did it ask about symptomology and whether or not people tested positive for COVID, but also asked, like, what was the impact on you? Did you lose insurance? Did you lose your job? You know, did you feel lonely? Were you isolated since, since there was such a, um, <clears throat> excuse me, such a separation of people uh, during that time? And then we did a minute survey on COVID-19 vaccines to ask people if they had gotten a vaccine, which one was it? And if they hadn't, did they plan to get one? So we have some information around sort of attitudes and, and uh, beliefs around vaccines. We will be releasing additional surveys on an ongoing basis. Currently, it's been about one per year. Um, that we're bringing on new ones. And we will be doing reassessments so that we can get longitudinal data of some of the same questions over time. I mentioned physical measurements, and so we, we kept this very basic. So when participants come in, they have an in-person visit. We take blood pressure, heart rate, height, weight, BMI, hip, and waist circumference. Um, and then we also collect a biospecimen. And so for, for the most part, we collect blood. We will collect saliva for DNA if blood cannot be collected. And then we also collect urine. Um, I mentioned uh, sort of the mobile or wearables um, that we are actually linking to. Uh, currently, we have um, where people can actually donate their data. And so I'm a Fitbit user. And I can actually say, yes, please include my Fitbit data into the, into my, as part of my data. Um, we also have a, a partnership with Apple Health Kit, and we hope to be bringing on additional iterations in the future. Currently, we have heart rate by zone, minute level heart rate, uh, daily activity, uh, intro steps, and, and we're moving into sleep data, which was just released in our last, um, uh, our last data release. And this is just like a little screenshot of how people can go about sharing their own data. We are whole genome sequencing everyone, as well as doing a, um, what we call an Illumina diversity array on every single person. Uh, we have three genome centers, one of which is here at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and not only are we doing the genome sequencing, but we're actually returning results to people. And so we actually have a genetic counseling resource, which is Color Health, who is helping us to responsibly return information to participants. Um, the things that we're going to be returning to folks over time include uh, traits and ancestry. So just broad level where your ancestors from. Here are some fun traits like cilantro preference, earwax type, things like that. But we just recently, at the end of the last year, uh, moved into returning the what we call the ACMG 59, or the 59 genes that are actionable from the American College of Medical Genetics, as well as some pharmacogenomic genes. And so really talking about Here's how your genes say that you should be metabolizing these drugs. So I've sort of already mentioned these things. Um, we are currently using the ACMG 59. I know that they have moved up to 73 and then again up again. Uh, we actually have what's called an investigational <clears throat> device exemption or an IDE with the FDA. And so in order to um, be able to move up to the uh, latest sort of ACMG uh, actionable list, we actually have to go through the FDA and get that approved, which any of you who have worked in that space know how difficult that might be. So let me talk a little bit about what data we currently have available. Um, right now in the program, we have over 632,000 participants who have consented to be part of the program. Um, 441,000 of them have completed the initial steps of the program, and what, by that I mean have consented to give EHR, 
have uh, done the first three surveys and have given us a biospecimen. Uh, we have linkages to 367 electronic health records. We're really trying to close the gap there between that 441 and the 367 um, by thinking of innovative ways to link to different electronic health records. And we have 457,000 participants with biospecimens at our Mayo um, Biobank. If you look here on the right, I guess your left, no, right. Um, you can see our enrollment over time. You can see that big blip where we sort of evened off for a while there, that's COVID. That's when COVID happened. We really had to stop in-person enrollment due to the safety of our staff as well as our participants. And so we really had to sort of think outside the box about how we can continue enrollment um, while dealing with this pandemic. And so we've moved to uh, doing things like sending kits to participants where they can go to Quest Diagnostics and have their blood drawn. Uh, where they can enter uh, height and weight themselves, um, so it doesn't have to be an in-person kind of thing. So we're really trying to be innovative and think outside the box, and um, this program has been really great at doing those kind of things. As I mentioned before, um, we are really focusing on including people who have been underrepresented in biomedical research. Um, we have uh, participants from all 50 states, as well as Guam and Puerto Rico. Um, and 75% of our participants are what we call underrepresented in biomedical research. And so that includes race and ethnicity, but it also includes low income, low education, sexual gender minorities, uh, rural people who aren't near a large regional medical center. So it's folks who really, we haven't seen a lot of their data because they have not been participating in research studies to date. Uh, on the right hand side is sort of our breakdown of race and ethnicity. So 75% of our participants are underrepresented, but we are really aiming for 50% or more who are racially and ethnically not represented in our current medical and biomedical research uh, databases. Uh, we actually just released a, a big chunk of data at the end of April this year, and so um, when, when you see these numbers here, just keep in mind that that's the number of participants that we have this data for, and so, um, we just released uh, 413,000 plus uh, survey responses across those six surveys that I showed you before. Uh, the physical measurements is around 337,000, and that's because we sort of had to make that shift during COVID. Um, so we are missing some folks with some physical measurements. I mentioned that um, Illumina diversity array. So we have uh, 313,000 individuals with um, array data. 287,000 individuals uh, with EHR data within our system, and nearly 250,000 whole genome sequences. We have uh, almost 16,000 people with Fitbit records. Um, some of the new things that we've been adding in include uh, pilots on structural variants as well as long read sequences. And really, with those pilots, we're really trying to enrich for African ancestry, since uh, the genomics community really hasn't had um, those variants and really hasn't seen uh, what kind of uh, variation can be whenever we actually have a diverse sample. So when you start to think about each of those data types individually, and you start to think about participants and who has what data, you, this, this is a really, really powerful resource. And so, um, you know, I've already sort of mentioned some of the genomic stuff, which is here in, the, in this yellow box, but when you start to think that 206,000 participants have a whole genome sequence, EHR, physical measurements, and survey responses, so you're getting, you know, you're getting from that participant what their experience has been, plus what their doctor said in their EHR, plus sort of the biological um, stuff that's there. And so it goes down from there, right? But um, that's a really rich data source. And I'll tell you about how to go about getting access to it. I will say that um, when we released this almost 250,000 whole genome set, we found variation at more than one billion with a B locations, which is about one third of the genome. And so this is, to date, the uh, largest variation um, genomic data set out there. So access to our data. Um, so we are on a cloud-based platform. We have three tiers. The first is a public 
tier that is open to everyone. No login is needed. You don't have to go through institutional verification, anything like that. You can go to researchallofus.org right now, go on our uh, data browser, and see what's currently in our database. You can actually see if I ask this, if I want to really look at this survey question and I want to know how many people answered that, you can see that. And furthermore, you can break it down by age, you can break it down by uh, sex at birth. And so you can get an idea of, wow, this data is in here and you know, maybe I do want to write a grant to investigate this a little bit more. And then we have a registered and controlled tier. So registered tier um, has more individual level data, but not as much as our controlled tier, which has very granular level data. And that's sort of where our genomics sits as well as most of our EHR data sits on that controlled tier. In order to get to the control tier, you have to have an institutional agreement, which I think many of the universities represented here already have in place. And then you have to uh, verify yourself as a researcher, take a responsible conduct of research training, which is about 30 minutes, and then you're in the data. So if you already have your institutional agreement in place, you don't even have to go through those steps to get that. It's already done by your institution. They've already verified. They just need to verify you are a part of that system and you have access to the data. I mentioned already the data browser, this is the publicly available piece. Um, you know, I, it seems like it would be kind of clunky, it wouldn't work, but actually this is a very cool tool. And a lot of people use this to create graphs and things like that for presentations about what could be done. Um, you can see here there's tiles um, that go through the EHR domains as well as the genomics and all the surveys that we have. Um, you can actually click on any one of these tiles and really dig in a little bit deeper, or you can search by keyword across all of these. And so if I was really interested in triple negative breast cancer, I could put triple negative breast cancer in the keyword search. It would give me all of the conditions from the EHR as well as any personal or family health history um, and any genomic variants that would be there as well. I mentioned that it actually will create charts for you and tables, and so you can really get in, this is a search for pain, um, so you can really get into, uh, in the EHR, I'm sorry, search for pain in the EHR data. You can sort of see how um, uh, pain was sort of um, noted by many different doctors across, across uh, various health systems and things like that, but you can also click on the graph as well as click to get more detailed information and actually pull out these charts that give you a breakdown by age and by uh, sex assigned at birth and things like that. So even on the publicly available tier, you can actually do a lot to sort of get an idea of what's available in the data. We also have a genomics browser within our uh, publicly available site, which is like my favorite tool, which you know is so nerdy of me, but you know that's kind of what we, where we all are. Um, and so you can actually dive into your variant of choice, your allele of choice, your gene of choice, get the breakdown by the different ethnicities that we have within our very diverse data set, as well as do some of the more, um, the age, sex at birth, and things like that. But um, I really love the genetic, the, the variant browser. To me, it's so fun and um, really gives you an idea of where those one billion variants really are happening. The thing that I love about the All of Us Research Program is we are on a cloud, so we actually use um, the Google, Google Cloud. <clears throat> so you can't download the data, which is a big shift from where most people are as far as sharing data. Um, and we're not your typical cohort study where you have to write and apply to, to get the data um, over and over again based on what project you want to be doing. So you actually get a data passport. Uh, which is a, a, a fairly new model that's been uh, around in a lot of big data you know, circles, but it's something that we have implemented here. Once you have your data use um, agreement in place, or what we call the Dura, you, um, you have to put what your project's doing on our website so that our participants and other folks can sort of see what's happening with the data and what, what researchers are actually doing with the data. But once you have access into the system, you can explore. It's not getting a download of certain data types. You can actually explore and add additional data types in. Um, you can ask several different questions. Um, and so it really does free the data 
a lot more um, than it ever has been before. I will say the data is free to access, but you do pay for compute time. So I mentioned we're on the cloud system. Uh, you have to pay for the cloud computing cost. We're really working on getting down to a science of how much a GWAS study might cost and really giving examples of how much it costs because people are writing this into their grants and they have to have a, a budget that's really reasonable. Um, but everyone starts out with $300 worth of computing credits. So this is um, at least a way to get, get people used to working with the system as well as uh, using the data without actually having to sort of link to a purchase order or a grant or something like that. And we have several different mechanisms for linking to payment options. We do now have a data, um, data roadmap on our website which actually uh, talks about what's coming next and when can we expect to see it. So for the longest time, we didn't have genomic data up. Um, people were constantly asking, when's the genomics data gonna be up? When's the genomics data gonna be up? And so now we're really talking about what's next, what's coming next year, what's coming in six months so that people can start to plan and think through, okay, well, maybe I'll hold off on putting that because they're gonna be linking to environmental data next and that's really you know, gonna make my study that much better because I'm gonna have that, that environmental data as part of that. Uh, we are also starting to um, think about ancillary studies and how we might partner to bring in additional data into the program, so things that might be on a subset of participants or really might be a very specialized assay or something like that. I am actually in charge of, of that big task and in addition to my day job as deputy chief medical and science officer. So if you have any thoughts or questions about how we're doing ancillary studies, I'm, uh, I'm happy to talk about that as well. So let me talk a little bit about our research tools. So in addition to the data, we, um, we have workspaces that are available. Uh, we use Jupyter Notebooks as far as um, doing the, the analyses and queries. Uh, we have some point and click tools which are really nice, including a data set builder, a cohort builder, and then a really extensive researcher um, support hub. Currently, to use our data, you have to be pretty proficient in coding in either R or Python. Uh, we realize that that's limiting, um, so we really are trying to bring on more user-friendly programs, including SPSS and SAS. Um, more to come on that, but currently you do have to be pretty proficient in data science, um, and specifically R and Python. We have a, a data dictionary that's online for anyone to look at and use. We actually um, are harmonizing everything in the OMOP framework, uh, which was developed by the Odyssey Consortium. And so each of the different data fields are, are really um, harmonized and standardized to that OMOP framework, which a lot of other groups are moving towards as well. And as I mentioned already, we have amazing user support hub. And so uh, not only are there like fre frequently asked questions, there are videos. We have our own YouTube channel where they'll actually walk through um, several different uh, analyses and show you how to do things. Um, we have office hours once a week where if you're having trouble with your, um, with your project, you can actually log on and have one-on-one -on -one attention about your project, which is unheard of and I don't know how sustainable that is long term, but currently it's working really well. Um, but um, lots, lots there. And then also we have been um, not only doing presentations all over the place, but um, we've been partnering with people so they can actually incorporate some of this into their curriculum. So if you're teaching a data science program, you know, actually using some of the All of Us data for projects and things like that down the road. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what's going on with, with what people are doing within the research and workbench. So we currently have over 5,000 uh, registered researchers at over 510 institutions. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This map here is not an actual map. I think it's actually just a graphic that someone put together, but we have users across all 50 states. You can see most of them are academic institutions and we are working to get access for both um, for-profit entities as well as international. This is currently only available to US-based researchers right now, but we're working towards making it global. We currently have almost 4,800 active, uh, active projects happening right now in our, in our workbench, and 160 publications are already out um, based on that. 
And just uh, here, here on this box, you can kind of see what the top, um, top disease areas are since we're disease agnostic. As you can imagine, it's sort of following the top 10 causes of morbidity and mortality in the United States because we see so much more of that right now in our electronic health records. Um, so as I mentioned, um, this was as of last week. Uh, there are 154 publications that are using all of us data, so they are actively using our data, and 41 that have been published by the program. Um, here's some examples of uh, different things that have been done, but it's everywhere from um, COVID-19 and using step data, as you can imagine, people sort of scaled back during the pandemic because they were stuck at home, and that really hasn't picked up, and our data was able to show that, that you know, even though we're out and about a little bit more now, really we haven't returned to the before pandemic as far as getting steps in an act activity. Um, you can see, you know, um, actually a lot of eye data, uh, a lot of eye papers are out there, and that's something we were surprised about because we don't specifically have optometry data just yet into the program. Um, but, you know, they were able to do some pretty powerful analyses just based off of what was in the EHR. In addition to um, bringing on the additional surveys and the additional genomics and things like that, we are also going to be linking, uh, linking data uh, very soon. And so that includes, um, we're going to be doing a lot of environmental data linkages. And so uh, social vulnerability index, the environmental justice index, these are two that we are very interested in bringing in, um, as well as claims data so that we can really sort of triangulate the data between self-report, EHR, and then what was actually paid for by the insurance company, because it sort of gives us an idea of what really happened in that encounter. Um, so this data will continue to grow over time. With any study, there's uh, pluses and minuses. And so, you know, I, I think um, I let you guys know about the diversity of the participants in our data and our real commitment to, to research those who have been understudied in biomedical research to date. Uh, the granularity of data that you can get at just with access from a computer is phenomenal. The speed is quick. Um, we are trying to make this accessible to all researchers, at least in the United States right now, with powerful analytic capabilities. Um, and we want to be able to make it as easy as possible so those point and click tools that I mentioned are really helping with that. I do want to state that we are not nationally representative. So we are reflecting the broad diversity of the United States. We are oversampling for those who have not been uh, represented by medical research, but we are not in Haines. Um, we are not sort of those groups that have sampled um, from an epidemiological standpoint. We are working with those groups to create weighting schemes so that people can actually compare the two um, programs, but we're not quite there yet. The data is not comprehensive, so it's going to keep changing over time. I mentioned maybe there's people who didn't fill out a few surveys. We obviously don't have EHRs from everyone just yet, but we're trying to get there, and we're taking different approaches to get that. Um, we have a very limited uh, data set of environmental and social determinants data, but as I mentioned, linkages are, is where we really hope to be able to fill that gap. And then some knowledge of coding, and either R or Python is required at this point. So these limitations we're all we're, we're working towards because we realize that there are limitations of the program, but we know that um, there are ways to actually fill these gaps. We can't do this alone. We are indebted to our participants who have graciously donated their data to the All of Us Research Program, as well as the am amazing community and provider partner network that we have across the United States who really are trusted partners with many of our underrepresented populations and have really um, put themselves on the line as spokesmen and advocates for the All of Us Research Program to enroll these really diverse populations. And I, I mentioned a little bit about um, how we have um, centers across the United States. We have over 350 sites uh, that are actually actively enrolling participants as well as generating data for our participants. And so it's, you know, it's a, really a team effort and has been amazing. Um, if you want to be a researcher within all of us, I put the QR code here, but it's basically allofus.org slash register. Um, I think everyone here has an institutional agreement. If your institution does not have one, I am happy to help facilitate that and put you in touch with the right person. But 
once you're into the data, there's no limit to what can be done. If you're not quite ready to register as a user, but you wanna keep a, an eye on sort of what's happening with the program, we actually put out a, a newsletter um, every other month called the Researcher Roundup, which sort of gives like the highlights of what's coming out uh, from the program, as well as what new data is coming down the pipe. Again, spectacular effort, uh, really to be commended. A couple just for my education. Is zip code information encoded in there so one can try to do tracking by zip code and look for correlations there? Yes, yeah, so we currently um, obviously have the participant addresses. Okay. We are um, currently only displaying three level, three digit zip, which I know is very high level, um, but we hope to get to five level the five number five digit zip code, as well as geocoding every participant so that we can get not only where they're at and what exposures they've had, but also um, residential, residential history, so where they've lived before. So we realize that three digit zip is not very helpful for anyone and we're trying to get more granular. Um, so we're working towards that. And then two quick questions. Mm -hmm. Any uh, integration with the VA network to get their the VA network involved, because that would be an interesting cohort. And then the last question, any uh, advantage of having kind of a blog site on your website so that local experts might be able to help uh, newbies with kind of uh, simple questions to get them going, things of that nature, and share code, et cetera, et cetera. Thank yeah, you. that's great, uh, great question. So VA is actually one of our largest partners. Um, we don't currently have uh, million veterans program data, but people can actually co-enroll in the two. And so we're trying to think of ways to get the data from both, so you know if someone's enrolled in both. Um, I love the idea of sort of a peer-to-peer -peer sort of um, networking uh, piece. I don't know if it's networking, but you know, lessons learned. We actually do, um, are really getting to where people can actually share their workspaces as read only, so no one can go in and sort of mess with the code but you can rerun what they did and sort of get an idea of how they did what they did. And we're really pushing journals to sort of make that mandatory for any all of us uh, publication that comes out so people can replicate it. Um, I just wanted to ask with, with such a specific data set that you have on the individual level on almost all facets of their life, do you view any cybersecurity risk as far as having this data on hand and what are you doing to address that? Yes, yeah, so we actually um, do security checks on a regular basis. We certainly, during our consent, tell people that there are things that may happen, at, you know, may happen, but we're doing everything we can to make sure that the security is sound. And anyone who wants to talk about sort of the, the that's not my area, but anyone who wants to talk about sort of what we're doing on the more uh, specific level, I'm happy to put you in touch with our security team who's really thought this through. Really good work. I'm interested if you, in your system, capture the ongoing medications that people might take and if you thought about the fact that some people may not report when they take, say, vitamin supplements or natural products to treat diseases or antifungal creams that may interfere with drug metabolism, that sort of thing. Yes, yeah, so we capture what's currently in the EHR, but we realize medications is a little spotty in the EHR. So. We are trying to partner with um, some of the big pharmaceutical chains, as well as some of the claims data that I mentioned bringing in, um, including all scripts and other groups like that, so we can actually get more data on what people are taking. But the supplemental issue is certainly something we, one of the, um, you may have noticed that one of the ancillary studies we have coming on is called Nutrition for Precision Health. Mm -hmm. They are really digging into what supplements folks are taking, but the antifungals and things that are over the counter, I think, are missing. It's, it's a big hole. We've already heard today that, that GPT can lie, but it's actually a really good Python and R coder. And so have you guys thought about incorporating linguistic models to have kind of a natural interface to write the code for you to ask the questions in more of a native language? I would love to talk with you more about that. I was actually talking with our chief technology officer last week. We were up at Mayo Clinic and he mentioned this. But you know, to get it actually up off the ground running, I think would be amazing. Yeah. And, and we really want to open it up for people to use it 
who aren't proficient in R and Python coding. And I know that chat GPT really is good, good at that. Coder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>